Good afternoon. Today, I'm going to talk about problems worth solving. I'm going to start by telling a story. Once upon a time, there was a brilliant inventor. He's invented all kinds of things. He has a company already. He has patents. This is a really prolific guy, and he got interested in one particular technical problem. Why was this interesting? This was a problem that was so hard, all the academics before him did not solve it. They solved parts of it, but they never solved the whole thing. So he thought, I have the team to do it. We can do it. So they work on it in secret, complete secrecy, for years and years, and they solve it. And a few years later, they unveil the product. It's the year 2001, it's December. Does anybody know what product I'm talking about? What? Segway. Of course it's the Segway. When this thing came on the scene, everybody was so excited. This thing was going to be bigger than the internet. Cities are going to be built around it. It's going to completely transform urban transportation. But did it transform urban uh, transportation? Not really, right? They spent $100 million R&D money over the course of 10 years, and they thought they were going to sell 10,000 a month in the first year of shipping. Instead, they sold 30,000 in the first six years of shipping. After being sold for three, year, uh, three times, the company now uh, is owned by another company that's not Decker, who originally put out the product, and it's found its place in society. I just saw a Segway tour in Boston not too long ago, and I saw a policeman on a Segway in the airport. So it's got its place in society, but it did not transform urban transportation. Why is that? So if you go back to the early 1990s and talk to the technical team and you ask them, what problem are you solving? What is the problem you're solving right now, this exciting problem? Do you think they're going to say, we're solving the inverted pendulum problem? Or do you think they're going to say, we're solving the urban transportation problem? It's probably the former. It, actually, we have a little clue from history. In the year 96, I was interviewing for a job to work as a system engineer with DECA. And they were talking about this project FRED. I didn't go to work there, so it wasn't until 99 that I realized that FRED was iBot. <coughs> and this is a technological marvel. It's a wheelchair that can balance on its last two wheels and raise the user up to standing height. And it's the same technology. So it's pretty clear that they were solving a technical problem. Now, the sad thing is, if you look at urban transportation as a problem, and you take a tiny little city like Boston, where it's just a dock to drive around. Roads are made for horses. So how do people get around? They walk, they bike, they take the taxi. Except there's one small problem. There's never a taxi when you need it. This is in New York City. So if you start with that context and you do a bunch of customer development here, do you think you're going to come up with a 100-pound scooter that goes 12 miles an hour? Maybe not. Instead, you might come up with this. <laughs> or even this. Now, this Hubway is a, it's a startup in the Boston area, and it's a very interesting play. And it's completely transformed how college students got around in Boston um, in distances that are too short to Uber and too long to walk. So between these two companies, one very at scale and one very in the beginning of their journey, the way people get around in Boston, urban transportation, it has completely been transformed. And neither of them reinvented the vehicle in which people got around. So what's the moral of this story? I think that worthiness is in the eyes of the beholder. And you really have to kind of look at what problem you're trying to solve before you solve it. Because a good team with great talented people can solve anything. So I almost feel like in the beginning of a startup's journey, the key question to answer is not, how do I get this duct tape prototype all the way to mass production? But instead, what problem do I want to solve? And for whom I'm going to solve this problem? Because the rest of it will follow. You will solve it. Let's um, have a look at how you could actually, um, it's not, OK. How, how to actually get to a problem worth solving? I think that's just two steps. One, you have to define and refine your problem statement. And two, you have to get into the market and validate your hypotheses. Now, let's leave the segue behind and look at Kiva Systems, which is a completely different story. In the early 2000s, um, make mounds. Um, OK, this isn't really working. 
make mounts, got interested in the e-commerce fulfillment center problem. And he realized through his web van experience that these warehouses are very, very inefficient to run. Now, we all buy stuff from Amazon, and this is a warehouse um, in the month of November last year. Um, there's a blog post that descri describes how it works. And you can see stuff in aisles and aisles, and there are pickers and there are packers. The pickers were uh, the job of the picker. If I could just get it up. OK. They um. <laughs> All right. All right. Here's a picture of pickers. Their job is to push the carts around and find the stuff on every single order, all the stuff that you and I order on Amazon. They have the order. They walk this cart around, and they pick it off the shelves. And they have to cover great distances to find all the stuff. And then they bring the stuff to the packers, who stay put. This is a packing station. And the stuff comes to them, and they put them in shipping boxes. Now, where's the time spent? 70 to 80% of such a warehouse um, the expenses are going toward the pickers and the packers' wages, and the pickers spend 60 to 70 percent of their time walking. So you're talking about half the cost of running a fulfillment center being spent with non-value-added walking activities. So Mick thought, well, if we could just get rid of the walking and have the stuff come to the people instead of people go to the stuff, then it would be already very efficient. So, uh, so that was the re uh, define and refine. He took the business problem of warehouse efficiency, and he refined it to, OK, the root cause of that is the walking, so get rid of the walking. Then he went to validate the hypothesis. He went to talk to eight warehouse operators, and he thought if three out of eight saw the world the way he saw it, which is that the walking is a problem, he would incorporate and get funding to go forward. Eight out of eight instead of three out of eight um, said they were interested. So the rest is history. This is Kiva Systems, of course, and the orange robot brings these pods around, and they can bring one to a human packer every six seconds. So imagine this warehouse with the same square footage suddenly became much more efficient and accurate. And the interesting thing is what problems they solved and what problems they did not solve. They solved the complete problem of how to run an automated warehouse, but they did not solve some other problem that the field of robotics was very interested in at that point in time. The hardest problem in robotics and controls back in the early 2000s was how to send an unmanned vehicle to run around and build a map of unstructured spaces. And you could argue, well, this warehouse changes shapes sometimes. It's reconfigured. So that's a good problem. Well, the problem with that problem is it's the wrong problem. It's a very, very hard problem. And the way it would have to work back then, you would have to have these expensive laser um, sensors that would figure out the obstacles as the vehicle is moving around. And then it's going to build a map and navigate the vehicle around those obstacles. And you need PhD level algorithms to make this stuff work. In fact, these pictures are from a PhD thesis by a guy named Ed Olson, 2008 thesis. Now, if they decided to solve that problem, they would not have gone to market when they went to market. Instead, they said, well, we're going to solve the business problem of warehouse efficiency. We're going to use a very simple system. We're going to use fiducials. These stickers on the floor, they help the robot navigate their way around the warehouse. And they don't need to unstructure the warehouse, because the warehouse has to be organized anyway. They used not interesting technology that's very mature, and they made it work. Kiva Systems raised $33 million, and they were sold to Amazon for 775 less than 10 years later. A very different story. So let's uh, uh, look at why this all worked. This is a quote from a, uh, an article that Mick wrote for um, Harvard Business Review. And the, the interesting thing is naturally we use commercially available off the shelf parts wherever possible. Now, that's not necessarily a sentiment that most robotics companies undertake. They usually feel like they can make custom stuff better. But in this case, solving that problem didn't really contribute to solving the bigger problem of warehouse efficiency. So they took a different way. And by every account, they succeeded. So at this point in time, I want to kind of switch gears and do a little thought experiment. Let's take this framework and apply it to a fake technology and a fake product and a fake problem. Let's say you are an athlete. You run marathons, and you're super good. 
you, in fact, run marathons in less than three and a half hours. So that's scary good. Only 500,000 people finish uh, marathons every year in the US anyway. So you're super good, and you're very passionate about endurance sports. You're also a sensor geek, and you've, ima you've, you've imagined this wonderful sensor that's a magical thing you wear on your arm. It doesn't need skin contact, it doesn't need anything, and it magically picks up how you breathe, and with the accelerometer data and GPS or whatever else, all together you could put it into your magical algorithm, and it could come up with a coaching um, program that could help people like you train better. And you think, there's a company here. I have a sensor technology, I have an algorithm. I'm really passionate about endurance sports. There's a company here. Well, so the first thing you have to do is take that and define and refine. Now, endurance sports, that's way broad. That's all different kinds, and that's not actionable. You have to narrow it down and pick a beachhead market. You could say, wait, 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 that's stupid. I have a technology that's a platform technology. It could apply everywhere. I could make so much money. Why would I want to pick now? That's stupid. Well, the problem with not picking is that you solve a lot of problems shallowly. It's not going to please any one segment deeply. You're not going to succeed as a startup because you don't have the resources to serve everybody. You have to pick. So then, let's say you say, OK, I realize I'm really outstandingly good as a marathoner. That's not enough of me. So I'm going to just go one step down and find all the other people who run races, finish races. That's a lot more of them. That's still too broad. How do I narrow it back down? OK, in my running group, there's this person, Liz. And she's a young mom, and she works full time. And she's always complaining about not knowing how to train and how she wouldn't be able to finish these races if I wasn't there to help her. Liz could be my customer. All right, that's great. That's great. That's a lot more actionable, but it's fussy. OK? You've got some characteristics that define who Liz is, but you don't really know her. You don't really know what motivates her. You don't know what it's like to be her, what are her needs, wants, expectations. So you have to go out into the market and validate your hypothesis. How do you do that? You go and talk to a whole bunch of Liz's. Now you can say, oh, stop for a moment. I already know a Liz. Why do I need to find more Liz's? Or better yet, I am Liz. I am this person. I have a young child, and I run marathons. I don't need to see anybody. But the problem is the focus group of one is a very dangerous place to be. You don't want to be there, because how do you know the one person you know is not an outlier, as you might be, as this elite marathoner? So what you need to do is go out to talk to her. And how do you do that? You would ha uh, you know, do a bunch of learning um, conversations with Liz. And I've lost the touch again. Uh, OK, so you, what you're going to have to do is um, open, a store, uh, open a conversation with somebody like Liz, and you say something like, tell me the story of how did you get started running. What interested you in, running, uh, what interested you in uh, doing these road races anyways? You could say, tell me about the last time you ran a 10K. How was that? Was that hard? Was that easy? Were you pleased? You could say, you mentioned that you didn't make a personal best and you were frustrated. Tell me more about that. Say why, say why not. These are some standard ways you can actually have a learning conversation and understand what the other person is. What you don't do is go to Liz and say, I have this magical sensor and this magical algorithm. Don't you think it's great? Isn't it great? Do you, would you pay $19.99 per month? You, you don't start there. You start with a learning conversation. Now, uh, you could also say, however, that um, I'm a maker. I make things. I don't do people. I don't do people. I'm not so comfortable talking to people. Um, for you, we've got help. There's two books that I highly recommend for people who haven't a lot of experience going to do um, customer development. One is called Talking to Humans by a guy named Gift Constable. And this book is endorsed by Steve Blank. And the other book is uh, UX for Lean Startups, which despite the title, has the best outline of how to do qualitative market research. Uh, um, market research. So if I may uh, figure out how to advance. So what you need to do is like talk to a lot of lists and how many is enough. Um, I like the number 20, but honestly, if you talk to five people, you're going to have invalidated so many hypotheses like you wouldn't believe. And five is a good number. More is better. And the more people you talk to, the more the person comes to life as a three-dimensional person. And you meet this list in the street now, you're going to recognize her. You will know all kinds of details about her you did not know before. Now, that's all great. Now you've got your persona. 
there are two more questions to answer before you go and quit your job and start a company. How many lizards are there? Is there money to be made? And the reason why you want to ask the first question is that you don't want to end up solving a problem for 500 people in the whole world, some total. That would not be interesting if you want to be a for-profit startup. So this is a very simplistic view of how you can count heads. And literally, I spent less than one hour putting this exercise together. I would recommend spending one to two hours and no more. Why do it? You want to make sure that it's not an outlier population. Why not overthink it? You're going to learn things down the line. This is just a sanity check. And where would you find this data? The US Census is your friend. And um, sites that have statistics in your area of um, expertise, that would be your friend. And in, in this case, I just took, it, took this data from the US Census and the running USA 2004 state of the sports um, data. And the next set of questions is, is there money in it for me? And this is a much more complex question that cannot be answered in one hour. You're going to have to spend a little bit more time analyzing the financial model. How is she going to pay? How much will she pay? How do I find her? And how much is it going to cost me? How will I grow the business? How much does it cost me to run the business on a going basis? And all of that comes together and paints a picture of, is there a business here? Now, if the answer to all of that is yes, then you can go ahead and proceed with um, product development and build your minimum viable product and go out into the field and begin the cycle of minimum viable product testing. You test with lists until you get it done. Now, I want to wrap up this talk with a little reflection of worthiness. 20 years ago, if someone was to ask me, what's the problem solving, worth solving to you? I would say, has to be a technical problem. It has to be interesting, by which I mean, it has to be complicated. I like hardware and software things. I like things to be complicated, and it has to be a technical problem. If you ask the same question of me today, then I have a very different answer, if I could get to the answer. <laughs> um, not, OK. So today, I'm interested in solving business problems. I'm interested in uh, meeting real needs and reaching many people. And I'm interested in economically viable solutions. So I'd like you all to take away one question from this talk. Worthiness is in the eye of the beholder. What's worthy to me may not be worthy to you. What's worthy to you today may no longer be worthy to you in three years. So what problem is worth solving to you today? Thanks.